Good afternoon and good evening if you are joining us from across the Atlantic. I am Magda Terer, I'm the Schwedler Chair in Judaic Studies here at Fordham University, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to our second event this semester, out of many, out of over a dozen, um, and on a very unusual day. It's a Groundhog Day, it's a day that doesn't happen too often, uh, the second day of the month, of a second month of a year that ends with 22. And uh, so it's a quite an unusual day and I'm delighted to that you're joining us for our um, in Fordham NYPL lecture series in Jewish studies. The lecture series showcases the work of scholars who were awarded the Fordham NYPL fellowship in Jewish studies. We're proud of our partnership in, with the New York Public Library and especially it's the Rod Jewish Division and the synergy between our institutions. The fellowship program, which has been possible thanks to the generosity of the Pickett Family Foundation and Mr. Eugene Schwidler, has enabled us to bring scholars from all over the world to conduct research at the New York Public Library and to share their work with our community. Before I introduce our speaker, um, Sharon Aronofsky Weltman, this afternoon, I want to invite uh, Ludmila Sholokhova, the curator of the Dorot Jewish Division, to say a few words about the division and about uh, this partnership, what this partnership means for the New York Public Library. Mio, you can join us. Thank you very much, Magda, for this kind of invitation. So always a pleasure uh, to come here, to be with you. And uh, the events are just spectacular. And we are extremely happy to have Sharon Waltman uh, working on, on the New York Public Library premises to meet her and to learn more about her work and just really enjoy her brilliant personality. Uh, so the New York Public Library is uh, one of the largest collection. The, the Dorot Division of the New York Public Library is one of the largest collection of Judaica in the United States. But it has a very special mission because it actually makes all this book accessible to all people, to all of all different backgrounds. And our collections are very comprehensive and actually uh, and well-rounded and uh, have been assembled for over 125 years. This year we will celebrate 125th anniversary of the division. And uh, it's a unique library in terms that it covers evenly all areas of Jewish scholarship, all areas of Judaism without any kind of uh, really special uh, focus and uh, so all kinds of people can, can come here and find whatever they need. And it's also beyond the Dora Division collections. Uh, the Jewish collections are well represented in the other departments, in the Performing Arts Library, in manuscripts and archives, photographs, and uh, local history divisions all over. So uh, it's just an extremely interesting place to work and uh, additional benefit to meet the researchers specifically from the Fordham and YPL Fellowship Program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mila, for these wonderful words. So uh, it's time now to um, introduce Sharon. Sharon Aronofsky Weltman is the currently the Director of Comparative Literature at the Univer uh, Louisiana State University and is the Davis Alumni Professor of English. She's also the co-editor of the 19th Century Theater and Film Journal. Her most recent book, which came out last year in 20, oh, I guess now it's almost two years ago, 2020, the time sort of flies, Victorians on Broadway, Literature, Adaptation and Modern American Musical, won the 2021 South Central Modern Languages Association Book Prize and was named a must read summer theater book by Playbill in 2020. Last year, it was uh, among top 40 academic uh, bestseller books in theater and music, according to the Library Journal. Sharon Aronofsky Weltman's article on melodrama, Pornspiel, and the Jewish Emancipation won 2020 19th Century uh, Studies Association Best Article Prize. 
And in a few months, she will begin her time as the Margaret Belcher Visiting Fellowship uh, Fellow in Victorian Studies at St. Hughes College at Oxford University, where she will continue her research on Pollack, which she had done a little bit at the, as, our, as the fellow uh, at Fordham and NYPL. Before I hand over the screen to Sharon, I wanted to express my gratitude to those who made our public programs possible, uh, in addition to um, this fellowship program. Sh uh, Siobhan Verletza, who has made sure that uh, you receive the links uh, for today's lectures and has taken care of the logistics for today's and other events. I am also grateful to the Knapp Family Foundation, again, the Pickett Family Foundation, Mr. Eugene Schwidler for their support, and to so many of you in the audience for your generosity in supporting these events. But I want to particularly express my thanks for being part, for you, to you for being part of our learning community, for your interest in our offerings and for joining us on our, what, Turned out, turns out to be weekly programs. That's what keeps us going. And lastly, I wanna draw your attention to the next event um, exactly at, this, uh, at the same time and same place, um, Wednesday, February 9th at 4 p.m. The Salah Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies series, which we offer jointly with the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies at Columbia University, and we'll, we'll feature Sarah Zager, who will speak on Judaism and care ethics, possibilities and challenges. So I hope you'll join us. I will send a link to the events page where you can register for this event and others. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn the screen over to Sharon. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And the first thing I'm going to try to do is share screen. So let's see how that goes. Um, and uh, so that is how we will begin. Um, and I think this should work. So, um, so first, let me thank Fordham University, the New York City Public Library, Magna Tetra, Mila Sholakova and Siobhan Verletza for everything they have done to bring me here today. I also want to thank the Direct Jewish Division at the NYPL, along with all the curators, archivists, and the incredible staff throughout the library who made my two-week fellowship there both fruitful and fun. Yes, fun, <laughs> at least for me, because handling 185-year-old materials thrills me and gives me a sense of direct connection to the authors I study. The book project I'm investigating for this fellowship is on Elizabeth Pollock, the earliest Jewish woman playwright in Britain. It, Sharon, I'm sorry, the paper is on the mic, so it's disturbing the, the sound. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, thank you for interrupting, and I'm very glad you mentioned that. <laughs> uh, I'm experimenting with some different options here today, so please let me know again if anything else is not working well. Um, so the project I'm investigating uh, is a book project on Elizabeth Pollock, the earliest known Jewish woman playwright in Britain. We know very little about her life, but her entertaining melodram melodramas made lasting impact. They also address pressing issues such as the struggle for the emancipation of the Jews and of women at a time when both were subjected to overwhelming legal and cultural disabilities. Scholars have long assumed that only two of Pollock's plays are extant, Esther the Royal Jewess or the Death of Haman, exclamation point, and Sinclair of the Isles or the Outlaw of Bara. And that other, the other plays uh, listed on her title pages that you see here are lost. Yet strong material evidence exists of dramatic offerings by Pollock not mentioned on these title pages. For example, Uh, for example, several playbills from the Pavilion Theatre in London's East End advertise Pollock's echo or whisper of Westminster Bridge for, for late uh, June uh, 1835. Despite these announcements, um, the melodrama doesn't seem to have opened at the Pavilion and instead premiered at the Victoria Theatre south of the Thames a few days later 
uh, in early July as the echo of Westminster Bridge. Critics praised the play and production, crediting Echo with helping to improve the Victoria's financial returns during its revival in May and March of 1838 by bringing in good houses for several weeks. Most exciting is that there is a play text of sorts to analyze and interpret. The Skelt's toy theater version survives. A toy theater, for those of you who don't know about this amazing phenomenon, is a kind of puppet theater very popular throughout the 19th and early 20th century, enjoyed by both children and adults. Skelt's and other publishers produced souvenir plays and accompanying scenes and paper characters based on popular shows currently on the London stage. I am very lucky that the New York City Public Library holds one of the very few copies worldwide of the characters and scenes from the toy theater production of the Echo of Westminster Bridge. In this talk, which is drawn from my newest essay, Echoes and Whispers, Becoming Modern with Elizabeth Pollock, which has just come out in 19th century theater and film, I delineate the special pro pro problems associated with using a 20 page Skelt's toy theater condensation of the full length stage play to reconstruct some of the, play, the production's main features. Then in this article, I speculate that like Esther the Royal Jewess, Pollock's earlier play, as I have argued elsewhere, Pollock's The Echo of Westminster Bridge also potentially nudges forward the cause of Jewish emancipation. First, to set the stage for The Echo of Westminster Bridge, I'll recap my argument about Esther the Royal Jewess that I uh, made in Melodrama, Perenspiel and Jewish Emancipation which was published uh, in Victorian Literature and Culture in 2019. 19th century English law understood the political power of theater and theatrical assembly. Drama was censored and theaters highly regulated. Rules tightly constrained the performance of religious plays and prohibited anything that would seem to incite violence or civic unrest. The Licensing Act of 1737 drove authors such as Henry Fielding to abandon writing plays and switch to novels because of the burden of censorship faced by playwrights that novelists did not uh, incur. Thus, no matter what its themes, any 19th century British play inhabits politically charged terrain. Moreover, the genre of melodrama was born in France and popularized with the French Revolution. It was, as David Mayer has pointed out, quote, responsive to immediate social circumstances and concerns, end quote, providing social critique and often written for working class audiences at once reifying and interrogating class identity and hierarchy. It was the most widespread theatrical form in Britain for most of the 19th century. Its key characteristics include alternating dramatic and comic scenes, employing stock characters such as heroes, villains, and feisty damsels in distress, incorporating sensational effects, and using songs and musical underscoring to heighten emotion, something we still have in soap operas and films, of course. Incorporating melody into melody drama, as melodrama was first called, was necessary in the 1830s for a non-licensed theater like the Pavilion to remain within the legal restrictions forbidding purely spoken drama outside the royally licensed theaters of Drury Lane and Covent Garden. The Pavilion and the Victorian, Victoria Theater were permitted to stage only musical theater. Pollock's subject matter in Esther the Royal Jewess was also inherently risky in dramatizing a familiar biblical story, which was also forbidden, even one that begs to be melodrama melodramatized in so much of its plot and characterization. It's the story of Queen Esther of Persia, secretly Jewish, who saves her people from the villain Haman, who plans to kill all the Jews, by imperiling her life in an appeal to her husband, King Ahasuerus. Her uncle Mordecai, meanwhile saves the king's life and ultimately replaces Haman as the king's chief advisor. In the, in the theatrical environment of 1835 London, genre and venue dictated what was lawful to perform as well as subject matter. 
uniting topics surrounding law, gender, genre, religion, and Jewish emancipation in Britain, Esther the Royal Jewess is a touchstone for several key intersectional questions, both theatrical and historical. Generally read by critics as what in the 19th century was categorized as an oriental or exotic melodrama, and those are the terms used in the 19th century, Pollock's play, I prove in this article, is also a kind of Purim spiel or Purim play, a traditional Jewish entertainment that raucously and humorously dramatizes Esther's story through music for the Jewish holiday of Purim, celebrating the Jews' delivery from Haman's plot. Now, this is important because it was performed in a public theater, yes, in a Jewish neighborhood, but also a neighborhood populated by many other uh, populations, not only uh, um, Jewish people lived in um, the area of Whitechapel. Um, and that I, how do I know for sure that it's a poem spiel? Well, an easy example is that a backdrop descends in the final act at the very end of the play saying, Purim. Um, and uh, Queen Esther, the, the actress, uh, Queen Esther wishes everybody a happy Purim basically. By blending two seemingly unrelated genres, melodrama and Purim spiel, that fulfill wildly different social functions for apparently distinct audiences assembling at a commercial theater, Pollock negotiates some of the most imperative issues confronting Jew, British Jews and non-Jews in 1835. Pollock's play crucially brings together diverse groups, both in its storyline about Jewish people in ancient Persia, clearly an analogy to contemporary England at the time, and in its historically specific audience drawn from the demographically multifarious Whitechapel where the theater stood. Directly addressing the community in and formed by the Pavilion Playhouse itself, Pollock creates on the one hand, a picture of an already welcoming and inclusive nation in the person of King Ahasuerus, while urging on the other more tolerance and liberality from all parties, which Esther actually states in her final speech. Because neither population's reaction to the movement for Jewish enfranchisement and other civil liberties was monolithic, the play attends to the various responses within both groups to agitation for Jewish emancipation. Esther the Royal Jewess performs this critique smack in the middle of a decade that brought both exciting reforms and repeated disappointments to the Jewish population in England and to the overlapping community of the working class. Pollock's plays appeared at, histor at a historical moment full of change. It followed unprecedented expansion of the franchise in Britain, first in 1828, when well-to-do dissenting Protestants got the right to vote, that is anybody who wasn't Anglican. Um, and then 1829, when well-to-do Catholics got the vote. And then in 1832 with the first Reform Act when some middle-class people got the vote. It came just before the young Queen Victoria's imminent ascension to the throne in 1837. And she was the first queen regnant since Anne Stewart who died in 1714. The second half of the 1830s brought a series of hard fought but triumphant firsts. The first Jewish barrister, the first uh, Jewish London sheriff who was kind of like an alderman, the first opportunity for Jews to vote for members of parliament, the first right for Jews to attend the University of London, that is any university in England. They still couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, of course. At this moment of so much political and social transformation, Pollock's play advocates for mutual respect, ethnic acceptance, and a role for Jews in government in the form of Mordecai, um, a voice for women, uh, and most explicitly through plot, dialogue, characterization, staging, even music, a call for religious liberty. And I say even music because of some of the liturgical sounding music employed. To make my case that Pollock's generic merging of melodrama and perms speaks to and brings together several interconnected populations in this published essay that you see here, I provide lengthy but if necessary historical, religious, and cultural context for both theatrical forms as well as for the legal and so social status of Jews, women, Jewish women, and the British working class in the 1830s. But I don't have time to go over all of that today, so instead I'll demonstrate that the echo of Westminster Bridge does some of the same cultural or, ideolog or ideological work as Esther the Royal Jewess. 
The next section is called Toying with Melodrama. The Echo of Westminster Bridge was a hit for the Victoria Theatre, with at least 10 contemporary periodical notices responding positively to the clever plot device of a mystery solved by hearing a whispered confession through the peculiar echo in the alcoves of the Westminster Bridge. Designed, oh, sorry, I meant to show you this before. There you go. Designed by, oh, and well, I'll go back to this for just a moment, just uh, to show you that um, this is actually something that I found, I was working with at the New York City Public Library. So I really did want to make sure you saw this slide um, since it was very much part of my fellowship. Uh, but back to the Westminster Bridge. Designed by Charles, Charles Labavie, the historical bridge opened for use in 1750. Many artists painted Labavie's pleasing structure during its construction, demolition, and the century in between, often more than once, including Richard Wilson, Canaletto, Samuel Scott, William Anderson, uh, J.M.W. Turner, and James Abbott McNeil Whistler. The architecture of the architecture of the uh, the first Westminster Bridge, um, spanning the Thames and leading to Parliament, included a series of stone alcoves on each side, allowing pedestrians to shelter during rain. Um, I have another image for you on this. Um, strange. Okay, here. Um, so these are the alcoves, as you can see, on either side. A surprising sonic phenomenon meant that a whisper in one alcove could be heard perfectly on the opposite side. In production, the play, like these paintings that I was just mentioning, render the bridge visually, but they also um, add uh, the auditory dimension. The reviews of the Echo of Westminster Bridge strongly praised it, especially the performance of the well-known comedian, William Mitchell. But even more than the talented Mitchell, critics loved the fabulous three-dimensional set depicting an enormous and uh, realistic simulacrum of London's Westminster Bridge, alcoves and all. Even the generally anti-Semitic paper, Figaro in London, which excoriated Pollock's, the Esther of, uh, Pollock's Esther the Royal Jewess as trash, extolled the unparalleled success of the Echo of Westminster Bridge, praising Mitchell's performance and, ex and especially the extraordinary set. And I'm having a little trouble with my slides. They don't always, um, they don't always advance here when I'm asking it to. Okay, here you go. Um, the, the Echo of Westminster Bridge is another lucky hit. Mitchell has a good character, Maddie Nix, which loses nothing in Mitchell's hands. The actor has a happy knack of giving a vraisemblance to all his characters, which stamps them upon the mind as the representative of their class. His disguise in the second act is perfect. The last scene of this melodrama stands unrivaled on any stage. The spectator sees before him an immense model of the Westminster Bridge built upon and covering the whole stage. And from the farthest extremity, the actors walk across down to the footlights. The famous echo taking effect, uh, taking place immediately in front of the stage. The success was absolutely unparalleled. Even the spectator was taken with this play, noting that the Westminster Bridge crossing the Thames really did sport alcoves that the play dramatized so effectively. The last novelty at the Victoria is a melodrama of powerful interest called the Westminster Bridge. Founded on fact, it is said that every word spoken in one of the recesses of the bridge is audible in the opposite recess. We shall expect to hear of the bridge being blocked up by the curious, experimenting with the truth of this legend and the, of the whispering alcove of the Westminster. The spectator's amusing vision of the melodrama inspiring such a crowd of playgoers that they would block passage on the bridge while experimenting with its acoustics testifies to the power of Pollock's play for its contemporary audience and the spectator's expectation of its resounding success. 
So memorable was Echo, its murder plot, and its use of the Westminster Bridge, Bridge's acoustics, that the marble remained in cultural memory for decades, long after the bridge was demolished in 1862 to be replaced by the bridge that still stands. But while the spectator notes that the echo is founded on fact, over time, the so-called fact that the bridge was founded on morphed from the historically accurate rendition of its echo to its fictional murder and detection. In 1883, someone named Cologne wrote to Notes and Queries to ask about an old transpontine drama entitled Echo of Westminster Bridge, going on to explain, an incident was the discovery of a murder owing to a remarkable echo in the arches of the old Westminster Bridge. I should be glad to know upon what facts the story rests. Even as late as 1904, F.F. F. Battersea recalls the play at the Victoria about the echo on Westminster Bridge and speculates about the real murder that could have been solved in that way. An article by John of London never fails to call up pleasant memories and curious old half-forgotten facts. In Round London by Teetotum, he alluded to the echoes of old Westminster Bridge. Instantly there flashed into my mind memories of a night at the old Vic where I saw a play, the murder of I forget the name, or the echo of Westminster Bridge. A murderer was discovered through the echo. The story was founded on fact. Now, who can tell me the original story? The exciting theatrical experience of the bridge's visual rendition and its dramatized echo had tremendous longevity. One factor helping to maintain the bridge's cultural sticking power may have been its adaptation for the toy theater industry. The 19th century theater world had already figured this out. In 1887, William Archer commented on the effect of toy theater art printed by William West in extending the ce celebrity of, quote, great theatrical figures of his time, the Kembles, Keane, and Miss O'Neill, who are plus all very famous 19th century actors. Skelt's juvenile drama version of the Echo of Westminster Bridge was immortalized by Robert Louis Stevenson, who mentions it in his 1887 essay, Penny Plain and Tuppence Colored, a love song to toy theaters in general. And of course they could be purchased without uh, uh, coloring in the illustrations or with them, as you'll see in some of my slides. To be clear, the 20 page published Skelt's version is not the same as Pollock's melodrama. Skelt's advertises that their plays are expressly written for Skelt's, suggesting that the original authors may not even have been consulted, let alone credited. George Spate states that the authors were never mentioned in these publications. The heavily cut dialogue drops most of Pollock's usual wordplay and all her dramatic soliloquies. Instead, we get the bare bones of the plot in, in a string of action scenes. We have no musical underscoring, a necessity in the genre of melodrama, although toy theater performers probably created their own. The script gives just one interpolated song, The Miller of D, originally performed in Isaac Bickerstaff's Love in a Village in, 1870, in, 16, excuse me, in 1762. But it offers no sense of what musical accompanied the seven paper dancers in costume included in the packet to be presented um, <clears throat> at the beginning of act one before the dialogue even begins. And here you see an example of what you would purchase for tuppence colored uh, rather than penny plain, where you, where, the, where you as the purchaser would have an opportunity to um, uh, color in the, uh, the dancers. Cleverly drawn in mid jump, the men doing a pas de chat and the women executing a low saute arabesque for those of you who are dancers, they vividly render a taste of theatrical dance experience but are no substitute for the dynamic encounter with living bodies in motion that was part of watching Pollock's play. While at times the early scenes from act one read almost like excerpts from a comic drama, in act two and three, the action and dialogue are too compressed to gain an impression of how Pollock's language might have sounded. At times, the Skelt's play simply muddles the plot, including an unexplained gap of 14 years between act one and two. It's vital to recognize these limitations in using any toy theater adaptation to make arguments about its source. Furthermore, as Joanna Hoffer-Robinson points out, 
Despite the utility of 19th century toy theater artifacts as documentation of the live theater they adapt, the toy theater plays, sets, and costumes should be critically examined as performances in their own right. With that imperative in mind, it is also important to use available to tools to excavate Pollock's oeuvre. A comparison of the Skelts text and the theatrical reviews reveals that the truncated toy theater version follows much of the Victoria production, not only the identical list of characters, but also a two-dimensional toy theater flat rendering the bridge precisely as the reviewers described it, described the fully built set that they saw at the Victoria with the actors uh, coming from the rear of the stage down to the footlights um, uh, so dramatically. The murder exposed by overhearing an echo in one of the bridge's alcoves is preserved. Some comic business for the character Maddie Nix hints at what reviewers loved about seeing Mitchell in Pollock's play. Even a bit of Pollock's dialogue may have made it into the toy theater version, since there's at least one instance of wordplay that seems a bit ribald for juvenile drama, as Skelts is called. After raucously singing the Miller of D late, in, uh, late at night in front of his girlfriend's house, Nick complains that he has roused her aged employer when, quote, it was you I wanted to arouse. So the OED's earliest listing of the sexual meaning of the of arouse is from Kinsey in 1948. I find it hard not to read it as a suggestive double entendre, resembling jokes in Esther the Royal Jewess. These tidbits give us a sense of what the more full-length echo might have offered its audiences. Until a manuscript or publication of Pollock's entire play surfaces, the Skelts version of the Echo of Westminster Bridge is the closest thing we have to the original performed at the Victoria. And the next section of this talk is Melodrama's Bridge to Jewish Emancipation. The Echo of Westminster Bridge is a, uh, is a dramatization of uh, a story called The Parish Apprentice, a multi-chapter sketch in George R. Gleig's 1830 book, The Country Curate. The characters of John Bushel, Old Smeltham, and Martha Bushel all make the transition from Page to the Victoria Theater to Skelts. League's story depends on an anti-Semitic portrayal of its only Jewish character, Noah Levy, a peddler. When Levy the peddler first appears in The Parish Apprentice, he is established as a jolly and beloved figure with an atrocious Yiddish accent bringing fun along with his baubles wherever he goes. But as the plot continues, it becomes clear that his kindliness and amusing stories are sham. A complete villain, he uses this facade to gain the trust of his foolish customers. He masterminds the dastardly actions of John Bushel in murdering Bushel's employer, the blacksmith named, appropriately, Mr. Smeltham. Pollock's dramatization removes Gleig's anti-Semitic elements by eliminating, eliminating the villainous peddler altogether. Pollock replaces him with the highly praised comic role of Maddie Nix, who Nix things. He plans to steal from Smeltham while wooing and wedding the kind-hearted Irish servant, Dolly, whom he tricks to get at Smeltham's goods. In the play, Bushel is fully capable of his, uh, fully culpable for his own heinous misdeeds. Nix murders no one, but neither does he raise the alarm when he realizes that Bush, Bushel is killing Smeltham, instead demanding half the booty. But Pollock did not simply remove Levi the peddler from her adaptation to rid it of an offensive stereotype when she replaced him with Nix. Instead, she recuperates the peddler by moving him to Esther the royal Jewess which dramatizes the story of Queen Esther from the Bible, as I've said. There, Le Levi the peddler appears among the biblical characters of Esther, Mordecai, and King Ahasuerus with the same name, trade, and the same atrocious accent, bringing trinkets and joy to the Persian Jews of the fifth century BCE, who are not in the least taken aback by Levi's speaking the not yet invented language of Yiddish. Unlike Gleig's Levi, Pollock's Levy, the peddler, is a genuinely kindly and amusing fellow. 
She maintains the positive characterization that Gleek introduces early in the parish apprentice and then snatches away from any reader, reader who, perhaps like Pollock herself when she first read Gleek's book, had been hoping that finally a contemporary author in 1830 was writing against the anti-Semitic stereotype. With Levy gone from the play and swapped problematically with another oppressed other in the hard drinking Irishman, Maddie Nix, Pollock relocates the events from the countryside to London. Rather than a blacksmith, Smeltham is now a boat builder on the banks of the Thames. His name, Smeltham, endures, even though the boat builder clearly never smelts anything, emphasizing the play's tie to the source text. Bushel is still in Smeltham's employ, still secretly marries his boss's daughter without her father's consent in order to enrich himself, and still murders his father-in-law for his money, though not put up to it by the Levi Nix character. Everything in the adaptation that remains faithful to Gleig's anti-Semitic story highlights the elements that Pollock has changed. In the addition to the removal of Levi, these changes include both the setting and the set. Pollock relocates the story from Kent, where the sketches told by the country curate take place, and introduces the titular Piaz de Teatre, the set recreating the Westminster Bridge itself. The new city setting permits staging the denouement of the spectacular set of the Westminster Bridge across the Thames. This setting provides the vehicle for de the detection of the main plot element, Bushel's whispered admission of his dirty deed, overhood by the good man whom Dolly, the servant, has ultimately married. While the echo fascinated viewers in 1835 and remained in memory through the beginning of the 20th century, the massive replica of the bridge that dominated the final scene brought the play's most effusive praise as we have discussed. This set takes on special importance because the Westminster Bridge carries symbolic significance in the project of naturalizing Jews into the British body politic. Echo primarily participates in this project by removing the anti-Semitic portrayal from the plot taken from Glee, but also setting and set hint at coming transformations. Pollock's relocation of the story to London matters. A sizable Jewish population resided in the metropolis, unlike the English countryside, as laws still largely prohibited Jews from land ownership where Glee's country curate resides. Although no Jewish characters appear in this play, the urban locale makes reasonable their inclusion as normal residents in the play's world, perhaps as Smeltham's or Dolly's neighbors, rather than the monstrous duplicity as Gleig portrays Levi. It's because the urban environment was, and still is, far more diverse, dem, far, far more diverse demographically than rural England, Pollock's Surrey side that is to say, the south of the Thames, Surrey side dramatis personae would be more familiar to the Victoria's audiences than the population provided by Gleig's narrator, who lives in a landscape so replete with Englishness that even the bushes are described in Gleig as genuine English shrubs. The shift in the site of criminal detection from the country parish to Westminster Bridge carries emblematic significance for a population that still did not have the right to representation. The Westminster Bridge was, and still is, the main thoroughfare leading directly to the seat of government, the Houses of Parliament. It connects the lower class transpontine theater goers at the Victoria to the workplace of every member of parliament, the holy grail of political position not permitted Jews until 1858. Pollock's Esther the Royal Jewess depicts a Jewish character attaining the highest office for a commoner in government, the, the um, second in command to the king. Given three recently failed attempts in 1830, 1833, and 1834 to legalize the place of Jews in Parliament, and given Pollock's already advocating Jews' rights in a play in March 1835, seeking, seeking metaphors to suggest similar interests in her echo only three months later is warranted. 
In a sense, the play's magnificent set figuratively creates a bridge to Jewish emancipation and Jews equal access to representation while suggesting that some secrets should be audible to all, magnified through the seeming magic of acoustic science. It is significant that the whispering villain is not a Jew in Pollock's play when he is in so many other tales, including The Parish Apprentice. While none of this proves that the echo uh, of Westminster Bridge promotes Jewish emancipation, when considered in conjunction with Esther the Royal Jewess, Echo's anti-Semitism anti reverberates across the centuries. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sharon, uh, for this uh, very interesting talk. I invite everybody to pose questions in the Q&A section. I, uh, I see we already have some, so I'll, I'll pose. I have uh, several questions on my own, uh, which I hope I'll, I'll get to ask. But let me start with uh, a question that came in very early in your talk. Um, uh, someone, uh, one of the one of the participants is. I recently saw a musical adaptation of Dion uh, Boucicault, nineteenth uh, century melodrama on the streets of New York, which deals with the challenges facing Irish immigrants. In many ways, it reminded me of what might see in a Yiddish theater. Did Pollock interact with other playwrights and writers who might have influenced her? or whom she might have influenced. And I actually had a question about her influence. Uh, what do we know what her impact was? So that question um, certainly uh, overlaps with mine. Well, this is an excellent question. And the truth is we know so very little about her for sure that it's difficult to answer um, whom she might have known or whom she might have influenced. Um, it's easier to see who might have influenced her uh, but by looking textually, mm -hmm. but there, unfortunately, we don't. We're I'm not. We're not even positive uh, as to her birth date or her death date. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, what we know for sure is that she wrote these plays um, that either we have a manuscript, uh, excuse me, uh, published versions of, or we have we have um, playbills that um, list them. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Busico, of course, is working a little bit later. So. Um, uh, it's possible that Busica would have known her work. I, I don't, since I don't know how long she lived, I can't say whether or not she would have ever met or interacted with Busica. I'm sure she interacted with the author of the first Sweeney Todd melodrama, however, uh, because he actually acted in her uh, mm -hmm. her shows. So um, that's George Dibden Pitt. He played King Ahasuerus, and um, so I'm certain that they interrupt, uh, interacted. Um, and in fact, I, I wonder sometimes if the, uh, the you know, um, Sweeney Todd um, advertised itself uh, as being founded on fact. So I wonder if he borrowed that from uh, Pollock. Mm. Of course, there was no real Sweeney Todd person. He's not a historical figure. So I do think she may have influenced um, George Dipton Pitt. Um, as for, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I have three possible different birth dates for her, and each one would make mean that she's a different person, uh, and and it's it's very hard to um, figure that out. There was there was another part to that question. Can you remind me what the other part was besides it, her influence, her, whom she would have known, and whom um, she uh, so the you know it was a it was uh, sort of uh, tying it connecting with uh, with the Yiddish theater. Uh, uh, and 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 the interaction with, with playwrights and and the influence so that that you answered yeah. um the the theater in the east the in Whitechapel the pavilion much much later on that uh, right. Esther the royal Jewess um uh, was performed in much later on became the Yiddish theater in London but not at this time right and I actually uh, was your answer to these questions uh had, sort of raises two questions that I had one was about actually telling us a little bit more about the Jewish population in London in the 1830s. I think we are far more uh, familiar with the earlier periods um, yes. when you know Sephardic Jews are very prominent, yes. and the later period that is when Whitechapel becomes the seat of you know East European Jews. Yes. But but that that period at this this time is often you know kind of 
not not very very well um, known. So I wonder whether you could uh, explain that and also talk a little bit about the actors who may have been in her plays, especially in these Jewish themed plays. Yes. So uh, they do not uh, appear to have been particularly likely to have been Jewish actors. Uh, and you know the 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 um, so that's interesting. Um, what is um, someone who, who <laughs> I haven't mentioned that I really must mention is her musical collaborator, because of course, these are all ki a kind of musical theater, they're all melodramas. So her musical, uh, the, um, uh, the person who wrote the, um, who composed the music for Esther the Royal Jewess was Edward Wolf, um, who, uh, uh, definitely was Jewish and who uh, I, I have been able to find out much more about uh, than Elizabeth Pollock. So the book project may ultimately be a sort of um, look at him as much as a, 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 at her. Um, she, I mean, excuse me, he, um, he there and some of his music actually has survived um, at the Boston Conservatory of Music. So I have not made it there yet to take a look at it. Um, but he left, uh, um, London in 1838 and emigrated. He came to the United States. He first lived, uh, he lived in Mobile. He lived in um, New Orleans and then he settled in New York um, where he continued to write music and then also um, librettos and um, even fiction. Um, and he worked also uh, writing music for local synagogues in New York City. So that is actually a very exciting avenue for me to continue to mm -hmm. um, pursue. And then her son, his son, Benjamin Edward Wolf, uh, became much more famous in all of these same ways. And in fact, wrote the play Westward Ho, which later became a, a well-known movie, Westward Ho. So, so that, that lineage is one that I wanna pursue. Um, and in fact, I need to go back to New York and check out some more materials at the library uh, to do that. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the, uh, um, um, that's, I think that could be a very fruitful person. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, um, the, the one thing you, when you, it, it sort of, even when just reading your, your description for the, for the talk, and it, you mentioned she's the first female playwright in Britain. So it's a very no, Jewish. Co Jewish. Jewish, first Jewish female playwright, in really very qual uh, you know, qualified. So the question I have about the Jewish and the Jewish female and the Britain, uh, were there any other Jewish playwrights in Britain? Yes. Were there any uh, Jewish uh, female playwrights anywhere else at the time? So if you could sort of elaborate a little bit on the you know, history of Jewish theater for us. Yes, so you have really nailed it because the truth is I think she might be the first Jewish woman playwright period. That, okay. is, that is not anonymous, that you know, I, I can't find anyone else yet, but it's impossible to prove that she's first. It's just that I haven't found anyone else yet. Eventually I'll give a talk and someone will point somebody out to me but nobody has yet. And I mean, you know, like I was thinking Golden Age Spain, surely someone in Golden Age Spain, you know, hi, someone sure. anonymous, you know, but, but I haven't found one yet. Sure. Um, certainly there were other Jewish playwrights in England at, the, uh, at this time, um, but only in terms of professing Jews, that is to say people who, you know, identified as Jews, they're uh, only starting in 1830, just five years earlier. So that's really soon after does she become um, uh, uh, a successful playwright. Um, so the earlier ones uh, who are her direct contemporaries and who will have a chapter in this book um, are um, uh, the mo most prolifically, I think, Charles Zachary Barnett, C.Z. Barnett, who um, was uh, writing for the same theaters that she was writing for, but starting in 1830. Um, I imagine they knew each other, uh, but again, I have no evidence of that. There's another guy also named Barnett, named Morris Barnett or Maurice Barnett, uh, who is also uh, um, identif self-identifying as Jewish. Before that, there were some people, there were some authors who uh, had Jewish heritage, uh, men who had Jewish uh -huh. heritage, but um, no evidence that they um, considered themselves to be Jews. Um, so so that's, uh, uh, I. what really interests me is, you know, the fact that 
I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by this and I'm gonna have to uh, do a lot more work on this. Um, the period of time, the, the, the time in which um, Esther the Royal Jewess first, was first performed was of course during, right before Purim in 1835. This happens to also be the period of Lent when there were strict rules about what kinds of theatrical mm. productions could be presented. Mm -hmm. Only musical productions could be um, enjoyed on certain days. Um, so it would make sense to, uh, um, you know, uh, come, you know, attract um, maybe more Jewish clientele to these public theaters during this period uh, because uh, um, mm -hmm. people who are um, rigorously following Lent might not want to go during that time or only if there was a musical entertainment. Mm -hmm. So um, what that what I found is that there are a lot of Jewish themed plays in March throughout the 1830s and 1840s in neighborhoods that have large Jewish populations. Not necessarily at other times of year, but a lot, it's like a hotbed of Jewish entertainment in, during the you know, Purim slash Lenten season um, during this time period. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm gonna be looking at that mm -hmm. as well. That is fascinating. What about um, sort of putting her work and, and that particular work um, in the context of what is, Another new thing that's happening that is the uh, serialized novels that are coming out, and we of course, again, this is not. I think Dickens is is writing his Oliver Twist just around the same time. Yes. So what's uh, you know? Can you sort of uh, flesh it out for us? Yes. In fact, uh, C. C. Barnett, Charles Zachary Barnett, has um, an Oliver Twist adaptation. Um, that comes with serialized novels, the thing that's so amazing about them, and this happened for every single Dickens um, pub, uh, novel and uh, you know that, that he wrote, when he serialized them, it, they would be dramatized long before the serial publication ended. C.C. Barnett's uh, adaptation of Oliver Twist was one of those early appearing plays where he just makes up the rest of the plot. Um, and Fagin's a good guy. Fagin doesn't, you know, doesn't incite any murder of Nancy. He's he's really just, you know, he's funny. He's a, you know, a little bit, you know, he's 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 a uh, um, he's not a great person, you know, but he's he's not the villain that he is in the novel. So um, I see, you know, um, Oliver Twist in some ways as, um, it, you know, there are a lot of things that you know we we know a lot about why. Uh, about about Dickens feeling uh, bad about Fagin later on when uh, Eliza Davis writes him and uh, um, in the 1860s he he um, removes so many of the anti-Semitic uh, mentions of the word of, of the conflation of Fagin and Jew he's called the Jew the Jew the Jew hundreds and hundreds of times in a, in, in 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 what is clearly an anti-Semitic way Eliza Davis who is Jewish wrote him and said you know that's not cool. <laughs> and he, he wrote back, he wrote back apologizing, essentially justifying his action. But then he removed um, many of those, um, that labeling and, and, and not all of them still reads very anti-Semitic, but um, he removed a lot of that and, and, you, and changed the word to Fagan, the name to Fagan. So um, what I think might have been going on in 1837, and this is not normally um, the way we talk about it, but there, there is, I, I suspect, you know, although his, he, his sort of benign, um, Dickens is sort of benign, non-invested non anti-Semitism that was reflecting the time, um, and I say benign only because it wasn't malicious and virulent, but it, it's not benign in terms of its effect. It's, it's absolutely devastating in terms of its effect because in part because of the iconography that Cruikshank's illustrations of Fagin right. produced. So that is replicated on the stage over and over again. And then later in film, which takes That's its right. iconography from the earlier stage plays and from the novel, the illustrations in the novel. So I think partly what's going on with Fagin is a backlash against, because that's, a, you know, in 1837 to 1839, it's a backlash against the very um, advances that we were just talking about are happening in the 1830s. It's a, um, and of course, this is a standard um, sort of um, phenomenon when uh, marginalized groups begin to get um, rights, there is pushback. And yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you could even go back um, to the 18th century and the resurgence on interest in uh, the Merchant of Venice, for instance, uh, exactly at the time when when yes. uh, naturalization 
uh, laws about Jews are uh, are being debated. So yeah. I want to, uh, we have time for one more question, uh, which came from a fellow scholar, Sonia Gollans from London. When I think of Jews in the 19th century, Sonia uh, writes century mirror dramas, I can't help but think of Jonathan Hess's Deborah and her sisters and the discussion of tragic Jewish women written by men in plays like Leah the Forsaken. Yet the Jewish peddler character type also seems to come up frequently like in George Buchner's Wojcik. To what extent will you be discussing gendered Jewish stock characters in your work? That is an excellent question. And I love that book by Jonathan Hess. I, I reviewed it, in fact. Um, I, um, uh, yeah. Um, to what extent will I be talking about gendered Jewish characters? Absolutely. Also, in addition like to stock Hesse, gendered, uh, stock, right? Stock, stock yeah. Jewish characters. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so that, of course, that um, that immediately brings to mind. Um, um, oh my God! I suddenly am not remembering her name. Ah, she she's written all about the the Jewish and and conversion narratives and ah. Suddenly, her name has just escaped me. It begins with a V. Waldman. Yes. Um, okay, Waldman. Um, yes. So, so of course, she talks a lot about um, the uh, um, the what is becomes a stock uh, character of uh, the the Jewish young woman with an oppressive father, uh, similar to maybe what we're thinking of with Jessica in The Merchant of Venice, um, who converts. And there's a conversion narrative, and it's all about how she's, you know, in Christianity, she can um, find um, uh, more liberty and, you know, her true identity. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a stock character. It's not maybe something we think of now as a stock character, but in the early 19th century, it absolutely was one. And there are, we can certainly read Pollock resisting that. And um, the only character who is explicitly Jewish in the novel, in the plays that we have extant, of course, is Esther herself. And what I think is vitally important in her play is that her version of Esther and her and Esther's marriage to King Ahasuerus is one in which she is never asked to give up her identity, never asked to convert. They marry, so there is, you know, um, intermarriage, but it's an intermarriage that never ever suggests that she would need to, in fact, he Hashwaras literally says, I would never ask you to worship my in my religion. He, he actually states it. So so I she um, pushes back against that gendered mm -hmm. stereotype, a stock Jewish woman character stereotype for the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This was uh, really very interesting, very wonderful. And we look forward to, uh, to learning more. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, uh, researching and finding, and maybe you'll you'll find her, and maybe the name Pollack might mean something. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Mila, and the New York Public Library for partnering with us, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I hope you'll join us next week and the week after. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.